Jupiter was backed out of the processing facility in uh, early July, just after the 4th of July holiday. The boosters and external tank were stacked in parallel in the vehicle assembly building while the work was going on in the orbital processing facility. This is shuttle launch control. We have the flight crew at their uh, breakfast table. We have uh, payload commander Jan Davis. She's flying uh, for the uh, third time today. And we have Bob Kerbeam, shuttle rookie, flying for the first time today. And commander Kurt Brown, making his fourth time in uh, flight today. First time as commander. Kent Rominger, two-time shuttle veteran. And we have Stephen Robinson, flying for the first time today. And Canadian astronaut Bjarni Trigvason, also flying on the shuttle for the first time today. Crew has been awake now for uh, just about half an hour, getting ready for the first flight day on their upcoming mission. Crew is uh, ready to go. They came to Florida uh, Monday evening and have been uh, at Kennedy Space Center preparing for the flight over the last couple of days. Well, it was August 7th, 1997. The vehicle is all ready to go out on the pad. It's a busy morning launch morning, so we were all uh, had a little bite to eat, got into the suit room, got all suited up. It takes quite a while to do that if you've seen a previous flight. But everyone was in great spirits. Everyone was excited to go. Got beam away from the uh, breakfast table. <laughs> and uh, Steve's all excited. And last but not least, Bjarni got his suit all checked out. And uh, he was ready to go also. We have Canadian astronaut Bjarni Trigvason making his first flight on the shuttle today. Trigvason was born in Reykjavik, Iceland. The vehicle's out in the pad. It's fully loaded with propellant and fuel, and it was a flawless countdown. It was all ready to go. We departed the operational checkout building, the crew quarters where we stay, for our trip, uh, hopefully our only trip out to the pad for this flight, and uh, due to the great weather and the countdown, it happened uh, our first try. Once in the white room, we'll get a little bit more equipment on, our harnesses for our parachutes and oxygen bottles, and now we're going to show you inside the cockpit Climbing, kind of doing a chin up here to get into the, uh, the seats. A little bit different view than you normally see. Joe Tanner was our astronaut support person to strap us in, try to get comfortable. And on the mid deck, while that was happening, Steve was getting in the MS3 seat. Kent's getting his helmet on. Jan's doing what she always does. <laughs> Now, actually, Jan, if you see on the left down there, is in the uh, cockpit already. And the last but not least was Beamer, or uh, Bob Kerbeam, to get in the uh, MS-2 seat, our flight engineer for ascent. The mid-deck's ready to go with Steve and Bjarni all strapped in. With everyone aboard, it's time to remove the uh, white room. It rotated back, as you can see. At two minutes, they give us a call to close our visors. So we put our visors down and turn our suit on. He's only gone to, uh, to two handrails, one in the center of the... Uh near the windows and one on his right side. And then as they hold his parachute, he pulls himself down into the seat. Adjustment on channel 152, please. 10, 9, 8. We have a go for main engine start. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery on a mission to study planet Earth. Roger, roll. Roger, roll, Discovery. Houston is now controlling. The roll maneuver is complete, and Discovery is now in a heads down, wings level position, headed to a 160 nautical mile orbit. Ram dilemma manifold. Copy, no action on the dilemma. All three main engines now throttling down to 67% of rated thrust as the orbiter passes through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle in the lower regions of the Earth's atmosphere. Telemetry indicates all three auxiliary power units and fuel cells continuing to perform well.
Discovery, go at throttle up. So it definitely gets your attention. You know the boosters are now separated. We can put our visors up at that time and ride the, uh, the three shuttle main engines to the orbital speed and orbital altitude with the, the rest of the ascent. After we get off the tank, the tank re-enters the atmosphere. That gives you some idea of our speed. This is real time. This is not sped up. In the middle of the payload bay is the Krista Spas, one of our primary payloads, which was a scientific satellite looking at chemicals in the ozone layer. And on the very first day, we had to deploy a Krista Spas to give it as much time as we could on orbit. And here Steve and I are in the aft flight deck uh, getting ready for those robotic operations with the shuttle remote manipulator system, the Canadian robot arm on the shuttle. And here I am maneuvering the uh, Canadian RMS to the Krista Spas grapple fixture so that we can uh, grapple the Krista Spas, as you see here, and lift it up out of the payload bay and take it over the payload bay and get it ready for deploy. And here it sped up a little bit, this function in the last scene you saw. We celebrated uh, the success of this arm by eating some Japanese curry rice. You notice the chopsticks and rice and curry, which was just delicious. We also had a little free time later in the flight when we got an extra day, and one of the things uh, our folks did was some fluid experiments. Uh, fluids tend to uh, form a ball because of the surface tension they form a sphere, and here we're trying to join the red sphere and the water together, and we were successful after a few tries. Main gear touchdown. And nose gear touchdown. Discovery's rolling out on runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center, completing 189 orbits of the Earth while traveling 4.7 million miles. STS-85 is the 23rd mission of Discovery and the 86th in the shuttle program's history. And another smooth landing for Discovery at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida after one day of delay. So that was a total of 12 days on their journey in space. And uh, they did accomplish a great deal of tasks while up there for the 12 days. Most notably, they discovered that the Earth is being bombarded by snowballs constantly. Here's the uh, view of myself working with the, uh, again, with the microgravity vibration isolation mount. His work is really designed to better understand some of the challenges we face with doing sensitive uh, fluid physics and material science and crystal growth experiments on the space station. Many of these will be affected by the vibrations of station and MIM, which is the uh, little purple thing in the lower half of that double enclosure just in front of me, actually is a magnetic levitation system that will isolate many of these experiments from the vibrations of station. On this flight, we were looking at two different things. One, how well MIM works as an isolator, how clean an environment it can provide to the experiments. And then uh, using uh, the MIM with the experiments mounted on top of it, looking at the effect of the vibrations on the experimental results, uh, uh, both for isolated situation and sometimes running it in non-isolation mode, and sometimes using MIM to actually vibrate the experiment with controlled acceleration levels. And this is uh, me with one of the fluid cells that we're using. Uh, this particular cell is designed to study the inter interaction or the di dynamics of an interface between a fluid and the vapor above the interface. Uh, I will spin the cell uh, on the MIM to establish a void right in the center of a cell and then look at the dynamics of the interface between the fluid and the void here. And this is sort of a fundamental problem uh, typical of many experiments that we'll do on space station later on. Well, following those uh, days of hard work and lots of exercise there and washing your hair, you do have to spend a little bit of time sleeping. And sleeping in space is uh, a little bit different than sleeping on the ground. Uh, for one, you don't have a mattress to lie on. So if you tried that, you would just float off the mattress and your blankets would float away. 
So we use uh, sleeping bags uh, and just tie these down to any convenient spot. I happen to be tied to the floor here. Uh, Rama was tied above me at the ceiling, and uh, Jan and Steve were tied to the wall uh, above my head in this picture. And you just let your body relax. And the, uh, where my hands are in this position, uh, it's just a natural place that your hands go if you're completely relaxed. And uh, without the, uh, the effect of gravity trying to pull them down, they just float in front of your face. You'll notice I don't have a pillow here. First couple of nights, uh, there is a pillow that's kind of attached to the sleeping bag, and you can kind of tie that to your head to give you the uh, comfortable feeling of uh, being at home sleeping on your bed. But after a couple of days, uh, you don't bother with a pillow and just let your head float around. Uh, one of the pleasures of coming back uh, to space, uh, from space is you get to lie on a bed and, and feel that thing against your back. But it's uh, great doing this stuff in space. Here's a view of uh, my hometown, which is Montreal in uh, Quebec up in Canada. Uh, the big island in the middle of the St. Lawrence River that runs horizontally across the lower half of the picture is uh, Montreal itself. A little bit above that, right in the middle of the picture, you can see the Mirabel International Airport. You can see quite a bit of detail in the land uh, from space. Um, and a lot of these, not only are they pretty to look at, they give uh, geographers and geologists and uh, meteorologists a lot of information that they can use to better understand uh, this earth that we live on. In this shot, the orbiter is actually uh, about over the middle of British Columbia, which is the uh, most westerly province in Canada. And we're looking down south from there in the lower part of the picture. Uh, you can see this town, the city of Vancouver and some of the uh, silt coming out of the Fraser River into the Georgian Bay. Vancouver Island just to the right in the lower half, and then the Puget Sound, the Olympic Peninsula, and up just uh, above the center of the picture, the Seattle area, and right near the top, the Portland area and the Portland or or Washington, Oregon border. And then Mount Rain, uh, Rainier there is uh, just in the upper left corner of the, uh, of the uh, picture there. Just a, a lot of very incredibly good, pretty views of the Earth that we live on. It's a pretty incredible experience to be able to uh, fly on a vehicle like the shuttle and uh, look at this beautiful Earth of ours. And uh, in this view, uh, what an added bonus in this flight was we're in the high inclination orbit, so we get to see a majority of the Earth in this flight. And this uh, picture here, you can see if you uh, know the shape of a little country called Iceland, which is where I was born, it's just off uh, below the horizon there, just to the right of the orbiter's tail. And uh, to be able to see a country so far north of the equator is really quite, a, quite an amazing thing. And it's uh, very pretty colors in the ocean here, and it's a very beautiful view. Um, and it's even better when you're up there able to see it with your own eyes. 